I think it is now three minutes past six. We already have 26 people on the call. I think it's going to be a, a very popular topic. Um, people are always passionate about children and pediatrics. So we um, will have people joining as we go on. But I think we're going to start the evening. Um, and I would really want to give a very, very warm welcome to Dr. C. Kriti from CMH Hospital. She's a pediatrician, very passionate about training and especially always very good at teaching the young interns under her care. And has been very keen to also offer support and has literally jumped at the chance to be able to, to give you some tips and skills and particularly in managing children um, with fluid therapy out in, in the areas where you are working. This tutorial is part of the Rural Onboarding Program. It's a six weeks program where we're putting materials together um, in resource packs to help new doctors, new clinicians coming into the Eastern Cape. But we also find a lot of experienced um, existing clinicians has also been very keen to get a little bit of a, an update and a touch up on some of their skills and some of their knowledge. Um, and so we're very happy to have some sessions that will be focusing on children. Our next session on Monday night will be Dr. Mikaela Lotz, and then we're going to be focusing specifically on neonates. Uh, so tonight is our chance to talk a little bit about children. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. C. Gaiti now. Um, what I will going to ask two small things, please, in the chat section, just write your name, where you are from, and what you are doing there, if you're an MO or a ComServe or clinical associate or what your role is. Um, and if you're not yet on my database, just make sure to leave an email address because then I can send you a link to the recording afterwards. Um, if you've, and then if you want to ask questions, it's usually easier to either put your hand up um, and we'll make place for, I think there's gonna be on the second part of this talk, um, Doc's gonna do a demonstration for us. So we'll make time for questions before she does the demonstration, but you can also put questions in the chat and we'll come to those um, later on in through. So I'd like to hand over uh, to Sisanda. Thank you very, very much for doing this for us. And we look forward to, to hearing what you, what you need to tell us. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Susanna Spitty, pediatrician at CMH. Um, I thought uh, I could um, share this talk with you because um, I'm also, a, I've been working for more than a decade in the rural Eastern Cape. So I really know what struggles are out there for the doctors who are working in the rural and I know how much support is needed when you're out there. So yeah, I'm sort of very excited to share this talk and I'll also then share my experience from the other side. Now I'm from the other side of being able to assist other people. At one point, I was the one who was on the other side of the phone looking for assistance. So, uh, and then I chose the topic, the intra intravenous fluid therapy, because I know for a fact that uh, a lot of doctors still do struggle with, uh, with the um, fluid management. We've had a lot of people, uh, doctors uh, coming and, uh, um, what's the word? bringing us babies from the periphery where they have uh, failed to put up lines where uh, children come in shock. So I thought, uh, let me just give a refresher talk uh, and also to say, we understand the struggles that you go through, especially in the uh, resource limited uh, areas, which most of uh, the Eastern Cape Rural, uh, it's like that. So I'll then, uh, just introduce my talk and say I'll talk about the history of intravenous fluids and um, why am I stuck? So just hover over the slide itself. Um, okay. Move That's your okay. There we go. Uh, the volumes and uh, special considerations, the medications, the complications, and then I also. I'll also add some things as I go along. So in my talk, I was then um, inspired to look at uh, uh, when did uh, the fluid therapy uh, was, uh, when did it start to be used in their practice? And I realized that it was used uh, far way back in the 18th 
in the 18th century, whereby the Lancet had recorded the first description of hypovolemic shock. And then further on, there was a cholera epidemic in the in India and, and East Asia in the 1800s, where people then they were treated with blood uh, bloodletting, meaning that they would uh, take some amount of blood out of their system to cure the the cholera pandemic until uh, Dr. William Oshuganes, an Irish physician. Uh, came with an idea or made, he was also a scientist. So he came up with an idea that as the body loses weight, uh, lo loses water, it also loses the salt. So he came with a way to replace the salt and then end the water. So he decided to go and uh, suggested that uh, uh, instead of retaining the blood, they can retain the water uh, with the natural specific gravity and the uh, and then they correct the, the deficiency in the alkaline. So uh, further on, you worked with Dr. Thomas Latta in the in May in 1832. Their study was really uh, largely ignored, uh, and uh, only several decades later, 55 years to be precise, that their study was taken into a rational basis. So today we are uh, administering fluids because of the work of these two men. I thought that would be interesting because I never knew until I, I said about it. So uh, in general, we have got a uh, different fluid compartments. We've got the extracellular, uh, which is about 40% of body weight and we've got the extracellular, which is 20% of body weight. And extracellular is comprised of two types, the interstitial, that is in between, between the cells, intravascular, and inside the, inside the vessels, and then transcellular, which includes the cerebrospinal fluid, pleural, peritoneal, and synovial fluids. And then just a, a recap, because I'm sure most of us know this, that uh, in the intracellular fluid, uh, it is its function is vital for organ, uh, vital organ to normal cell function. It's, it contains solutes uh, such as oxygen, electrolytes, and glucose. It pro provides a medium in which metabolic processes of Okay, sorry. And then the extracellular fluid, um, it is the transport system that carries nutrients and waste products from the cells. Then I would like to talk about the pediatric differences because uh, fluid management in adults is not the same as in pediatrics. So for starters, the extracellular and the intracellular a fluid compartment ratio, they vary with age. Not all the babies have got the same ratio. Uh, neonates and infants have a proportionately larger extracellular fluid volume. And then infants, uh, uh, infants, uh, they, they, they've got high daily fluid requirement with little fluid reserve. This makes them vulnerable to dehydration. Furthermore, um, Ages less than two years, they've got uh, immature kittens to handle uh, the, 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 the fluids and the electrolytes. And then they also, they, they, are, they are unable or they, they, their ability to conserve and extract water and solids is not as effective as an adult. And then the infants have a weaker transport system in the ions and the bicarbonate. Um, and then they are at a greater risk for acid base imbalances. And then there's also difficult in regulating electrolytes like sodium and calcium. Then, as I have already mentioned, that uh, different age groups uh, are taken care of differently because uh, their total body water is not the same. If you're looking on the first picture from your left, it's a newborn which has got about 75% uh, total body water and uh, the extracellular flu fluid compartment is 45 and the intracellular is 
as we go proceed to the next picture we can so and then what happens is that the brain and the skin occupies a greater proportion of body weight and are high in interstitial fluid but as compared to an infant as you can see now, the water content is a bit lower, which is 65%, having the 25% of extracellular and then 30 to 40% of uh, intracellular fluid. And then they've got the high uh, body surface area, which also promotes a fluid loss. And then they've got little fluid results in the intracellular fluid. And then they are at a greater risk of uh, losing a lot of fluids and also high metabolic requirements as they are growing and they are they, are, they also need to have a generous uh, uh, fluid intakes. Then as they grow older, uh, the total body water is uh, it, it drops to about 50%, extracellular being 10 to 15% as compared to intracellular, which is Forty uh, percent, um, and then in the in the in the child to adolescent, the kidneys are immature until two years, and are unable to conserve water and electrolytes, or fully assist in acid-base balance. So this is why um, the pediatric population can never be treated as uh, the adult population, and then the fluid volume imbalances. The, you can have a dehydration and the fluid overload. So dehydration is a loss of extra uh, cellular fluid uh, compartment and sodium caused by vomiting, diarrhea, hemorrhage, burns, and nasogastric suction. But we know in our settings, it's mainly vomiting and diarrhea. That is uh, uh, the main cause. Then it, it is manifested by weight loss, poor skin tagger, and dry mucous membranes, and then sunken fontanel. Then there is a fluid overload, which is the excess in extracellular fluid compartment, and uh, an excess in interstitial fluid volume and edema. There are a number of causes of fluid that can cause it, like a congestive cardiac failure could be one of them. Uh, the patient will be gaining a lot of weight, puffy face and uh, in extremities and an enlarged liver. So um, the types of fluid we have, we do have high isotonic fluids and hypotonic fluids. Isotonic, like a normal saline, that is trying to uh, mimic uh, the, the, the body homeostasis in terms of the solutes and uh, electrolyte. And then we have got uh, the hypotonic solution, which uh, can be used for maintenance, replacement, rehydration, and resuscitation. So I've got here a table that has got uh, may, most of the fluids that we have in government and that we have in the periphery. I know half DD is there, and it's in the main fluid for uh, gastroenteritis. And then some hospitals in the periphery won't have that 5% dextrose water, which is mainly used in dehydrated patients with uh, renal uh, problems. Then mentalite. Um, I haven't seen it myself, uh, but I did confess that I have been in the rural part of the Eastern Cape for quite some time. Then there is a neonatalite, potassium, and potassium with potassium and potassium free. Then there is, uh, which is mainly available in most hospitals, there's pediatric mentalite solution, which is really not uh, popular in this uh, in our setting. Then there's ringers lactate. Uh, mainly in most casualties, as well as normal saline. And there is a, a 0.45 saline, which is mainly used when you're mixing cocktails. And then there's 0.18%, which uh, is really not popular in, the, in our settings. Then there's oral rehydration, uh, those sachets that uh, will being, they are being mixed for oral rehydration and then there's the home mixture. So what is more important is the sodium content uh, that is uh, in these uh, fluids because um, 
as much as other electrolytes do get um, disturbed when there's diarrhea and vomiting and all, uh, also the sodium is the is the one of the first electrolytes to 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 be disturbed. So those that column is really showing us the the content or the the amount of sodium in those uh, fluids. Then uh, this um, I want to say I will just go through uh, uh, dehydration. Um, I will go through this because uh, we need a refresher. It's the thing that we know. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, we know that it's hard to detect uh, mild dehydration because the child is still alert, he's got uh, moist mucous membranes and he's got a normal skin tagger. And um, the weight loss may be up to 5% of body weight and the infant might be irritable. The older child might be thirsty, uh, asking for water or for a juice. Uh, the vital signs will probably be normal, and the capillary filter will almost likely to be normal, and the urine output will be normal or less. Then, to uh, then talking about the moderate dehydration, where now you find out that there are dry mucous membranes, delayed capillary filter. Uh, uh, six to nine percent of body weight loss, irritability, lethargy, unable to play, and is restless. And the urine, uh, urinal output now has decreased to less than one mil kg per hour, or the urine might uh, SG, uh, especially in children uh, more than two years. Uh, they might have a sanguine fontanelle, heart rate increased, BP decreased, and a, a vital signs might uh, might be uh, might be not normal. So then uh, I've 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 then uh, made this slide of severe dehydration slash shock overlap because uh, when you are severely dehydrated, there's a thin line that you can tap into shock. So I think it's more of um, an area of interest whereby you have to really, really assess your patient uh, so that you know whether you're going to go aggressively on your fluids. So uh, the weight loss uh, will be more than 10% body weight. The patient will be lethargic. Post. A, a repeat with the low BP or undetectable, and then the respiratory rate will be um, will be variable or labored uh, due to say uh, severe metabolic acidosis, a uh, dry mucous membranes, and a uh, fontanel that is uh, sunken, decreased or absent urinary output, and a couple of time more than four seconds. And then, as I had mentioned earlier on the sodium uh, in this kind of a uh, setting, that is in, in dehydrated patients, it could be low, high, or normal. Then, if it's normal, it's going to be an isotonic dehydration, that is a dehydration with normal sodium. Uh, it's due to loss of sodium and water in equal uh, proportions. And then most of fluid is lost from extracellular component. Then serum sodium, uh, the normal is 130 to 150, but uh, it differs from practitioner to practitioner. Some they like to say 135 to 148. Uh, but then uh, the bottom line is uh, these patients uh, are dehydrated from things like vomiting and diarrhea, which we see almost every day. Then there's hypotonic or hyponatremic dehydration, a greater loss of sodium than water. Uh, the same sodium will be, will be lower than normal. And then there will be compensatory shift of uh, fluids uh, from extracellular to intracellular, which makes extracellular dehydration worse and is caused by severe or prolonged vomiting and diarrhea. It can be caused by burns, uh, renal disease, and also by treatment of dehydration with fluids without electrolytes, uh, something like the, 
dilutional uh, hypo hyponatremia. Then the common etiology of dehydration in our setting is, of course, vomiting and diarrhea and, and nasogastric suction and burns. Then there's water loss uh, under a uh, light and warmer, which is most likely in neonates. Uh, accumulation of fluid in the third space, and then overuse of diuretics and excessive exercise, which is not really um, that common in our setting. So when you are managing this child, the one with um, mild to moderate dehydration, it's when we emphasize on oral rehydration solution. Uh, it's, a, and it's a treatment of choice and uh, it, oh, it usually works very well. If you give three, one to three teaspoons of oral rehydration solution every 10 to 15 minutes, and then you can ask the mom to be patient because you find out that the, the, the kids will uh, tend to vomit some or sometimes most of the oral rehydration solution. And then there's, um, or oh, we're aiming at uh, rehydration at 50 mL per kg per hour if we're using the oral rehydration solution. Furthermore, on the IV therapy, IV therapy is used for patients with severe dehydration who cannot tolerate oral rehydration solution. Uh, also, patients in shock. Uh, one can, when they are establishing a line, they can take blood for electrolytes and the blood urea nitrogen and a blood gas. But I know most of the hospitals uh, in the periphery, they do not have a uh, blood gas machines. And even their blood, they take time to get results. They are usually a sender ways. Um, now, furthermore, on the uh, dehydration, if the patient is 5% dehydrated, we tend, you will give 50 ml per kg and the maintenance. And then if it's 10% dehydrated, that would be 100 ml mils per kg plus the maintenance of that particular uh, baby. And then what is important is that um, 24 hour maintenance plus replacement should be given within the first six to eight hours in your, in your emergency room. It must be given as rapid as possible to expand the extracellular space. Uh, with short patients, uh, usually give 20 ml per kg bolus of normal saline. You can repeat this uh, twice or even three times on the healthy patients. Um, and then um, with the ones uh, that are malnourished and with uh, cardiac patients where their myocardium is not too strong, uh, we tend to give lesser amount, which is 10 ml per kg. Uh, then you must make sure you give uh, the IVs like slowly the remainder of uh, the IVs. Then another thing is the issue of maintenance fluids. I've just gone through the, the EML to see the standard guide is that uh, zero to three months, they should be given 150 ml per kg per day, three to 12 months. Um, or less than kg would be 120 ml per kg per day. Then there will be that, uh, those ones that have more than 10 kg, where now you're going to use, use the first 10, and then you can use the first 10 and replace by 100 ml per kg. The second 10, uh, you can replace at 50 ml per kg. Then the, the rest will be at 20 mils per kg, and then we must be mindful of the ongoing losses. Um, you can give 10 to 50 mils per kg for each loose stool, uh, or after vomiting, preferable the oral rehydration solution. Um, oh, this is just a, a workout on, 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 on when you're dealing with a bigger 
patient, let's say your patient is a 10 year old weighing 35 kg. So you want to determine this patient's uh, 24 hour maintenance fluid needs. So the first 10 of the 35, you're gonna give as 100 mils per kg, which is a thousand. Then the second 10 will be 10. Uh, will be 50 times the, the, the other, which is 500. And then the remainder, which is 15, will be times 20, which is uh, 300. And then you add all of those, and then you get the total uh, fluid maintenance for that particular patient per day. So um, what is important then is to consider um, when considering um, the maintenance as well as the rehydration, one should be mindful of the mothers who give their kids juice, uh, juice and other fizzy drinks that are high in, 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 in glucose because once the glucose is in the gut, it, 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 it acts as a as it causes osmosis and then it causes more diarrhea on the on the patient. So we must be mindful what the mothers give in the ward when their kids are saying they are testing. Then the fluid administration, we've got uh, quite a number of nice things that um, we can use to administer fluid, which I know most of them are not there in the peripheral hospitals, uh, that is uh, the, the drip chambers, the specific uh, drop si sizes, the devices that control fluid, the di I, I know there is a diarrhea flow, which you, uh, you cannot be really, really sure if you are giving the actual amount. It's not a pleasant way of um, giving fluids. Uh, especially in the deep rural as opposed to in the in the in the cities where they've got those nice pumps and also all the things that are really nice to give fluids then there's intravenous needle there was a scalp vein set which i i i, I can't see it in our in, in our setting the butterfly then there's the usual intravenous cannula and the central lines for very advanced um, uh, centers. Uh, I just took a, a few uh, pictures of um, what is luxury. That is, that's the usual, uh, the T extension, the usual, uh, the short line, which uh, allows you to give fluid within a, the short distance and you want to push fluid, especially when you want to give your boluses. Then there's the long extension, the one you usually put on a drip. Then there's the side port. So it's a side port because it allows you to push some medication and some, it also allows you to push some boluses. Yeah, there is a demonstration um, of how the side port uh, works. Uh, I hope that uh, our hospitals in the periphery at least do have these basics uh, to administer fluids. Then the complications, uh, you can have local complications like tissue infiltration, combatment syndrome. We've seen a lot of this. Um, and there are a lot of litigations when it comes to this kind of complications. And lawyers do really win the cases because you find out that after the combatment syndrome, there would be amputations. And then also we must be aware of the name band as, 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 as it might uh, squish the arm and also cause some necrosis. And then there's Tissue necrosis uh, that uh, uh, that involves the full skin thickness, especially when you put a, a line. I mean, you put your IV line on an arterial, on an artery. You first see blanching of the whole area. Then after the blanching, you, you must also see how you get the flow. I mean, the back flow that is pulsating. Then it should give you a, a clue that you are in an artery. 
and the 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 the, the, the consequences are very bad. I know one case where the whole side of the head was uh, necrotic, and of course the litigation uh, followed that case, and uh, I don't know what was the outcome. And then also you find out that there will be a scarring uh, as the as the drip area um, heals, and it, it usually stays there for quite a long time. It's usually I usually see it on the scalps of uh, babies where there will be even no hair in that area. So these are really uh, important uh, complications to look out for. Uh, systemic complications that could be an air embolus is you pushing in a long line. You find out that there are air bubbles that you one could easily flush them inside the, the system. Then there's infection, and then you sort of introducing infection directly to the circulation. Then particles from fluid and blood clots, uh, which can also cause an emboli, but um, I haven't experienced that. And then issues like giving a wrong type of fluid, like giving normal saline in a newborn. A newborn never gets a normal saline. You always give a neonatalite. And also giving potassium containing solutions when the patient has got high blood pressure. It's, a, it's also indicated fluid overload uh, is also another complication if it has not been uh, properly controlled. Um, we know that the patients will have a pulmonary edema, they will have a bilateral fine crepitations, they will also have uh, all of a sudden a hepatomegaly and also yeah, they might go to cardiac failure. Um, then increasing dehydration in gastroenteritis if not given at the correct rate. Yes, we need to be mindful of how we are correcting the, the flu. Then the pitfalls of uh, the IV fluids that if the babies are not assessed well uh, in terms of the degree, especially the chubby babies, especially the babies with high sodium imbalances, they will have the doughy skin. And then of course the chubby babies, one will think that they are okay whilst they are severely or dehydrated or shocked. And also the malnourished babies we have got uh, a loss of subcutaneous fat as well as um, whereby the, the the skin taker now will not be reliable in assessing uh, dehydration in those patients. Okay, and then the, also the issue of uh, fluid overload, which I have uh, mentioned earlier, and also uh, the issue of uh, a short hypernatremic baby who has maybe a sodium of 160, 163, one would be tempted not to give normal saline as part of resuscitation, but you would still give a normal saline for resuscitation for those patients, and then you deal later with the hypernatremia. And then you don't need to leave uh, medication in the cannula. And you just have to flush the medication and you switch off. I mean, there's a, that, that layer that allows you to close the drip. Then it would be nice to have a heparin, uh, the heplock, we call it the heplock, heparin. The heparin, uh, you can just mix a little bit of uh, heparin. You do a solution to heparinize all your uh, short lines. That it, this one also needs a careful mixture because the heparin is a very, um, a dangerous track if it's, if it's given with um, no caution. Then closing lines in terms it leads to blockage of the cannula and the blood clot. Uh, as you can imagine, if you were transporting a patient from a uh, fort for fort and then it arrives with a 
throated drip and then if you're not careful and you just push it you might push a, a, a big clot into the system and then lack of uh, confidence when dealing with babies it's yes it's a pitfall because i know and i've seen in most casualties um whereby when they see a baby when the doctors see a baby they are they get quite uncomfortable even without even looking at the baby what's wrong with the baby um i've seen one one referral says baby wrapped around the blanket referred to pediatrician <laughs> And that's how uh, it gets scary sometimes to take care of uh, small babies, uh, which is why talks like these are needed to sort of desensitize people and in, uh, in the periphery, and then they will be more willing to take care of babies. Then when it comes to the actual managing a dehydrated patient, maybe from gastroenteritis, there is what we call gastroflow sheet here at uh, Cecilia Makiwana. It works well because it gives you confidence in terms of which direction your patient is going. Uh, it's a pretty, uh, I couldn't uh, upload it in my presentation, but it has got a uh, weight, all the vitals. It has got, if you've got a guess, it, it records all your blood guesses and then the temperature and then the vomiting, how many times and even the diarrhea. In that way, each time, because you need to go and review your patients every four hours. So if you've got that gastro sheet, you can then see the progress in that four hourly period, which gives you confidence again to say, I am managing my patient too well. And I wish uh, even other hospitals can have this cast of flow sheet. And that way we will have less of, of um, referrals due to shock and uh, severely dehydrated patients. Uh, in conclusion, there is much progress when it comes to fluid types and the administration sets and cannula and infusion devices. But again, we are in the Eastern Cape and um, as much as there's so much available in other urban areas, we still lack gel course, uh, the usual, the yellow ones, uh, which it makes it very, very um, difficult for us to manage our patients. Another important thing is that the intravenous fluids you must give them uh, direct, uh, they give direct access to the bloodstream, therefore sterility is vital. Whenever you are going to introduce a cannula, you must make sure the, the, the area is sterile. Um, and um, that will be the end of my talk. Thank you to the audience. And also I would like to thank Dr. Hussein, my mentor, and the one who encouraged me to, to do this talk. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and then I would then demonstrate how to do an intraosseous line. Sasanda, so before you go on to that, shall we see if there are any questions? Guys, yeah. you can either put questions on the chat or you can put your hands up um, and just see at the moment if there's any uh, particular things. We'll make some more time as well after Doc's done her um presentation so if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask please either put it in the chat or put your hands up and i will i will share that looks like it's quiet at the moment if you're struggling to find your hands up button um okay great so uh Sisanda, there's just a question about the gastro flow sheet and what is included in that um, that, that you mentioned. I just wanted to say, I'll get Dr. Sigeti to send me the gastro flow sheet as well as this presentation. And we will send that round. So to my normal um, rural onboarding group and just put your email address on the chat if you want me, if you want me to send it. Um, but Sisana, could you just go through what's on that gastro flow sheet again? So on that gastro flow sheet, let me see if I cannot find it. Uh, um... 
I should have it somewhere. But if it's not part of this presentation, so it, it's basically the name of the patient, the date, and the time when, when the patient was admitted. And then it has all the vitals, that is the temperature, the BP, the heart rate, and the, and the capillary refill time, the skin tagger, the fontanelle, and the... And then what happened? I mean, this, after that, there is how many vomiting, how many times did the patient vomit and how many times did he have diarrhea? And then the last bit is what has been done about whatever abnormality that is in the, is in one of the parameters in the, in the gastro sheet. And then there's another column for a blood gas uh, to see if the patient is really improving in that uh, four hourly period. Um, I will send I will send you Doc, that uh, gastro yes. sheet and so that you can submit it. The next question here is how to calculate the 24 hour replacement in dehydration. So you 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 calculate um, you know it depends which percentage you first uh, determine the percentage of um, of dehydration. There's five percent, there's ten percent, and then there is the then the other one is the, when the patient is shocked. So like I, I I've said earlier, if it's five percent, you give fifty mils per kg then one would do it over 24 hours. You divide the whole thing over 24 hours, or you might divide it over six to eight hours. Other centers, they like to also do four hourly, but the four hourly one tends to result more on fluid and overload. So if you're doing the 24 hour one, which is also acceptable, you say 50 mils times the weight, then you give divide all of that by 24 and you you add that to the maintenance um, I hope I'm yeah, there's a there's a great slide in the presentation so we'll send around the presentation that has those calculations but i think mm -hmm. it's useful as the fact that one can do it in eight hour increments i think that's partly what the question is asking towards rather than a than a four hour increment for example yeah the four um, hour increment is really uh, dangerous it gives fluid overload then the next question here is what is the correct age to switch from using nnl to half dd for rmos no the age uh, for me, once the patient gets out of the neonatal uh, ward and gets to the pediatric, that is that one, it's a, almost a full month. I think they can get the other fluids when they go to the pediatric ward. Thank you very much. And then uh, another very good question is, can we give antibiotics via an IO line? Yes, you can give antibiotics uh, 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 via intraosseous. Remember when you're doing the ATLS, ATLS also when they are like the surgeons are struggling to get a line and they maybe there's abrasions or what and what they do administer antibiotics, even in the pediatric setting you do, but like I said, it's a very temporal measure. We can never rely on it. It's a, it's a rescue measure, not a, a maintenance measure. Yeah, just until they can get it to somebody that, you know, usually it's to make sure your child is stable yeah. enough for transfer. Yeah. I think that's the big issue, is making yeah. sure that our kids still get in yeah. a good enough state to our bigger hospitals that the pediatricians can, can still do something. I think that's yeah, all that's of the correct. questions that's on the chat. I just want to check there's no um there's some some thanks here there's there's no hands up that i can see um please just remember if you do want me to send you the presentation as well as that gastro flow sheet to make, make sure to put your email address if you're not all, not already on my on my database you'll know if you're on my database you'll be getting vast amounts of emails from me so if you're not 
please put your picture address on there. Um, Susanna, any last comments from you? Yeah, I want to say to the doctors out there, uh, they must uh, try their best to take care of the small kids and just not, uh, you know, feel intimidated. There is that temptation that you'll be intimidated with pediatrics. I was once there in the deep end, but for me, I always had the love for pediatrics. So I would then attempt and that made me to be popular at uh, Nelson Mandela. When I was far in the deep end, I used to call this, 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 that. And they were very, very much, um, very, very much uh, helpful. As a result, I developed the love of pits. I know it, pits can be intimidating. I could, I see my intents. You, some of them, they really are out of place when they are through pediatric rotation. But uh, yeah. It, 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 it is a good, um, what's this, speciality, and then it just needs one to just uh, familiarize and try to be comfortable. And also with the gastro flow chart, I believe that once everybody uses the gastro chart, we will have zero referrals to bigger centers for shocked babies or severely dehydrated babies. I'm, I'm advocating for the gastro flow chart. Susanna, there's one last question here um, from Michael Harrison. For a shock neonate with hypovolemic shock, for example, a clear history of high volume diarrhea, would you bolus with NNL? Yes, yes, definitely. Well, thank you very much. Um, the recording of this talk will be available. We'll split them into two. There'll be the one part with all the theory and then we'll have separately the little demonstration on the, on the intraosseous line. There are also YouTube videos on intraosseous lines, but they usually um, demonstrate with the using of these fancy guns. Yeah, yeah. So I think what's made this really useful is how to do it with something that you might actually have in your emergency trolley in a rural hospital. So that's why we're so grateful for this demonstration. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to have me. It's, it's a pleasure. I'm humbled. <laughs> so what I'm now going to close the meeting officially. I always stay a little bit afterwards to do various bits of admin, um, but you are welcome to leave the meeting at this point. Um, and then remember to leave your email addresses if you want me to send you any, any further information. Our next session will be on Monday night with Dr. Mikaela Lotz, who is a medical officer working out at Madwaleni Hospital and has developed a particular passion for neonates. So your questions around general neonatal resuscitation and neonatal issues, mm -hmm. um, it'll be great to hear from somebody also from the coalface on Monday evening. And then next Wednesday, there will be a presentation from Prof. Hofi Conradi on preventing burnout, a build up, a, a sort of a build on what we were doing on Monday night. So look out for that um, as well. And I'll keep on sending you notifications every week of the exciting speakers that we have. Please make all of these videos are getting uploaded to my YouTube channel under Dr. Madeleine Muller. So if some of our, somewhere along the line, you lose me, um, you can just Google and you'll find them all on YouTube available. Have a very, very lovely evening, everybody. Thank you very much.